most of the systems that we see nowadays that we're working on, we have very little work in progress. A lot of it is just in time so that we're feeding, uh, we're producing complex products with lots of variables, different colors, different sizes. They're, we're not producing a thousand of anything anymore. We're producing one or two of these and five of those. So we're constantly changing. So with a, with a system like this, we're able to be very dynamic and move with the products. I just wanted to start with kind of a, an overall entry into a storage system and, and how we get to this point. As, as David mentioned, we, we got to the point with this customer where we're, we're sizing an IntelliStore and figuring out what is going to work best for them. And, and in this case, we want to look at a couple different things. We want to look at the customer's current material levels. You know, that's thicknesses of material, colors of material, uh, sizes of material, and pair that up with what their production looks like on a day-to-day -day basis, right? But in addition to that, we also want to look at what this customer's growth is. So if today they're cutting 50 sheets, but in the future want to get to say 200 sheets or 300 sheets, we want to be able to size the storage system accordingly. So we want to look at a couple different things and that's going to be one, an ABC analysis. So an ABC analysis is being A material, which is your highest running material, B material is your second highest running material, and C is your, your third running material. And, and so that is what we're trying to accomplish is basically keeping ourselves from sorting within the system as much as possible so that we're not taking away from our value production time on a day-to-day -day basis. Within the system, you can see, you know, we, we've sized this system based on this customer's particular inventory levels and, and also what their production looks like. We also have placed an in-feed station here and an in-feed slash out-feed station here so that we can also outfeed rainbow stacks of material to an exterior machine uh, in order to pick up on additional production capability. We get into these scenarios where where our customers are trying to get additional additional capability, additional production. And in a lot of cases, we can get up to 40% more, 50% more capability on a saw and sometimes on a CNC, depending on how many SKUs a, a customer might have. Because let's face it, at the end of the day, if you're constantly looking for material, constantly searching throughout your facility, offcuts are a mess, you're always going to be spending time material handling and that is that is a constant uh, waste of time for our for our customers and that's why when we pair them up with a storage system you don't spend any time now delivering material to a saw or to a cnc and that is uh that all of a sudden takes things to a new level and, and offers our customers the capability or opportunity rather to all of a sudden start picking up additional jobs that maybe they never had the opportunity to take before by just simply adding a, a storage system to their overall uh, to their overall facility. I think what's in, critical here when we are blending a storage system like this with the various machines that we have in the system is that the storage system gets the material to the right machine at the right time. So that even before uh, the production day, typically they download the production to the store tech machine and it will sort all the panels out and build the stacks in these positions here within the storage system it'll does what's called a prior removal so that way it can sort it can get the material in the right sequence for the saw and also for the cnc on this particular scenario we're using a b300 panel saw now on the b300 here with this uh hfe label table and again we prior remove the material or we can do a hot hot job, which means the saw sends an order to the store tech. It grabs a panel, it labels a panel, and then it produces and then it processes it, rips it, cross cuts it. And now once the parts come off the front of the out the out in the outfit of the, of the panel saw, the parts have been ripped, cross cut, and they have been identified. When we blend this saw with this type of storage system, uh, the night before and throughout the night, the store tech machine can take and pick the panels that the that the N500 CNC needs. It places on the label table the saw. So here, after the panels are labeled, they're placed in these prior removal positions so that the next day, the store tech can deliver to the N500. It can deliver pre-labeled panels so that once they're routed, they're completed and ready to go to assembly. 
once we have our storage system, we talked about our sawing, we talked about our labeling, and then next we're going to talk about our CNC. So this machine, as, as we call it here, it's an N500. It's a flat table through feed CNC router um, with what we call concept three automation. So meaning concept three is automated pre-label on the infeed, automatically loading the part through the router, automatic processing, and automatic unloading of the finished parts. What you're seeing in today's through feed type routing scenarios is that dependence on the operator to do stuff um, is not eliminated, but it's very focused on the operator catching finished parts at the end of the machine. The machine loads itself, it processes the parts. As the machine unloads the nest, it's cleaning the dust and debris off the spoil board or the machine table in preparation for loading the next sheet. Uh, the skeleton, the small pieces of debris, all get pushed off onto an outfeed table. The next sheet is loaded and starts processing while the operator is unloading and sorting from the label table or from the outfeed table. We have seen realistic throughput numbers into 100 up to 100 to 125 sheets in an eight hour shift. We talked about the level of software it takes to drive a system like this. And for us, we're using CutRight. There are many design packages out there, but ultimately we're coming out through CutRight to filter the information so that we're creating nests, we're creating saw files. And importantly for us is that same data that creates those, the saw files for the saw and the nests for the router. It also has all the information that we need on that label. And that label is more is important for after the sawing and after the CNC, CNC processing. So we have to do something with these labels. And with our labels, uh, what happens, we can dis display barcode information for our secondary operations. We can display routing details that tells the operator that we need to go to the edge bander, then ABD dowel insertion, then to assembly. You'll notice that as we're manufacturing less and less are, do we see stacks of stacks of finished panels that have been cut or CNC'd and there's not a piece of paper running around with it identifying the part and what to do with that part. What type of, of technology is in a banding solution for something like this? What are the things we need to consider when I'm when I have parts coming off of saws, I have parts coming off of CNC's, what do I need to consider in a system like this? So this is the 6.6 uh, FCG that we have in this layout here. Dave and James were talking about as far as they have all these parts labeled and they're coming down. The operator can simply scan these labels and it's going to pull up a job out of the controls and it's going to say, OK, this is three quarter inch material. We have two millimeter edge banding and it's going to set all of the stations automatically. So we need a lot of automation at this point in an edge bander. We want all of the stations to automatically adjust to the proper uh, position to ensure that quality of the finished workpiece. Some of the automation uh, that you'll find in these edge banders is going to be the infeed fence will automatically adjust. The top pressure belt will automatically come down. And we're using a belt in this particular or this particular edge bander. Um, and that's just to optimal clamping or uh, holding of the workpiece. The in trim station. Uh, we're going to index either straight or bevel, and this is all decided through that label as we pull up that program. Corner rounding. We have two different radii in, in this configuration. Are we going to use 1.3? Are we going to use 3 millimeter? The fine trim, we have up to about four different radii. Two profile, so we'll call it like a 1.3 and a 3 mil, a bevel, and a flush. And then in the profile scrape, when we want to get that nice finish there, we have two different radii that we can choose from there. Again, all of this is done through scan of that label or as the operator just pulls from the control. Uh, it's all going to be positioned for them. We want the operator to stay out of the hood of the edge bander. This Good. configuration has capabilities of processing EVA, PUR, and air tech. With that, uh, we will process the parts through the system and we want it now returned back to us and we're going to use the loop tech 300 in this um, layout 
The parts are going to come down uh, an air table. It's going to be like a tilt air table. It's going to be gently pushed down the air table and come down a conveyor belt to the operator. This whole time we're using gravity. So now we need to lift that back up for the operator so he's not bending over. So we, at the end of the conveyor belt, we will have a pneumatic lift air table that will position upward back to that normal working height for the operator. And then after this, we will pass through, you know, for a second, third pass if need be, or we go on to the next position. If you are uh, a dowel constructor, typically you're going to have a, a, a drill and dowel insertion machine in the process here. It's really common for us in the industry on the solutions provider side to look at how fast can we drill one hole and how fast can we insert one dowel. As we talked about on the saws with the with the IntelliGuide and the in the in the direction and the or the guidance that the machine provides the operator, put the part in this way. If you put it in that way, it's wrong. Uh, that technology has made its way into a machine as simple as a drill tech series drill and dial machine. And with the uh, IntelliGuide on the drill tech series machines, that simple little visual. I mean, it doesn't prevent that error from happening, but it's one more check for the operator to ensure that that mistakes are made as infrequently as possible. After dowel insertion through the drill tech, through the edge, after post edge banding, then we come into our kidding and kidding is essential, uh, is critical to so many of our customers. So in this solution, David, we're using the, the cab tech S250 and the S represents stationary, right? So we've got a through feed case clamp and we've got a stationary case clamp. So in the world of our case clamps, this is our, you know, our manual model. We're scanning out these parts. We're taking them essentially to our assembly area right in front of the clamp. Somebody's got a rubber mallet there that's assembling these these parts. They're they're pushing those the dowels into uh, into the slots of of this and they're building assembling essentially this this box ready to push into the clamp. Now they're not physically taking a manual clamp like like some shops might have and, and actually squaring this box up. That's what the case clamp is there to do. If I have a bunch of small shelves, can I do multiple at once? Yeah, a uh, really good question. So that's actually, you know, when I talk about the customer that does 500 cabinets a day, they're doing that on occasion where they're, they're stacking three, four cabinets or boxes into that at the same time. Because they, they can do that, right? They're all the same size. And so as those arms come down, come together, they're not racking anything because they're each acting as their own base to, to push against, right? The same thing the case clamp is doing. So it, it allows us to get more production out that way as long as you've got the right amount of assemblers upstream to, to keep up with that kind of pace. The same software that we use for kitting is expandable to where here in the hardware area, they can scan one of the labels of the box that they're producing, especially if you're bearing your component, you know, different colors, different shapes, different jobs, is constantly changing, coming down the line. Then what they can do is scan those labels, come up on the display. It'll show, it'll give them a list and a, and a picture of what hinges to use, what drawer pulls to use, um, what drawer slots to use. A lot of them change up with the, uh, you know, and any, any other information can be passed down. So through this process, we're able to, do the final touch-ups, the final assembly, then we come off the end of that conveyor line, whether it's driven or gravity, we're able to go directly onto. Here would be a great place for a Schmaltz lift. Uh, I see that a vacuum type lift on a, on a jib or a, a pivoting arm. We can pick those assemblies up, place them down on a, onto a pallet, build that pallet up, shrink wrap it, and it's ready to go out the door.